You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach in my living room in a beautiful navy blue top and cut off shorts. I did not wear this when I did the interview you're going to hear, but I want to explain first. I interviewed our guest, June Diane Raphael, the actress, activist, writer, podcaster, mother, superwoman. I interviewed her in February in Los Angeles at a time at which this moment in time would be inconceivable. I suppose we kind of heard murmurings of a pandemic, but not enough to really take it seriously because I think, I'm just trying to play this backwards, we would have thought that our government would have protected us from the carnage that we have experienced the last few months. So I met June Diane. I didn't even ask her if she likes to be called June or June Diane. I think June. I met her at the Jane Club, which is a women's co-working and uh, programming kind of place, a really pretty building in um, a neighborhood in LA called Larchmont. And it's kind of like a Soho house, but it's for women. And there's enviable, really great childcare there too. So for working moms, can you imagine you want to have a meeting with someone, but you don't have a place to put your kid? Well, it's not just childcare, it's good childcare. And you can have your meeting and your cold brew and your quinoa upstairs with your person. And anyway, it's just really lovely. So we were there talking about things that were applicable to February. So I want to explain. She will talk about Elizabeth Warren, who she supported for president. Okay, those days are gone, but so is going to a meeting and shaking hands with someone. So is eating dinner at a restaurant. So is getting a haircut. So is, so are the things that we did not consider pleasurable or special. Well, I guess they were. I guess they really were. And I guess what we're all feeling now is hungry for company, hungry for a change of scenery, hungry for connection. And I'm thinking a lot about people who live alone because as annoying as you may be to your partner or your partner may be to you or your brother may be to you or your sister or your parents, you at least have someone to talk to, someone to share observations with, someone to yell at the TV with, someone to cry with. But if you're alone, it's, it's just that much harder. And I just want you to feel heard. And, and I'm thinking about you. So... Back in February, when I had this cool meeting in this cool pink space, was it pink? It felt pink. I don't know. It was very bright and and cheerful. I got to meet June Diane Raphael, and I have liked her for so long, whether it was as the um, kind of um, mm, damaged bachelorette on Burning Love She was in The New Girl a bunch, and she's been on Big Mouth, but she also has been in Blockers and The Long Shot and Anchorman 2 and lots of comedies. She is a graduate of NYU and the Upright Citizens Brigade, and she has written a book with someone who used to work for Emily's List called Represent, The Woman's Guide to Running for Office and Changing the World. And... I have to say, when you're with June in person, she seems to have done everything except run for office. Now, of course, she's, oh, I forgot to mention, she's Brianna in Grace and Frankie. So she works with Jane Fonda, and I guess two activists together are very powerful. So this will be lovely conversation with June Diane Raphael. First, my five things. Number one the comedian Sarah Cooper. She was already on the sort of quarantine version of Ellen DeGeneres. She is a comedian 
who has dubbed or lip synced Donald Trump's more preposterous statements. But her acting, her face, she is a perfect lip syncer. She does it on TikTok, and you can see them on Twitter or Facebook or some anywhere. Google her, Sarah Cooper. And I have to say, that sentence, you can see it on TikTok. I wouldn't have said that a year ago. Number two, Exhibit C came for another visit. I had the best day. That's all. It was just great. Number three, my partner is transferring my hundreds. I don't think it approaches thousand or even 1000, but many hundreds of old videotapes onto digital files. And I had no idea I had so many, maybe 500. I don't know, uh, a lot. And every now and then I walk past his desk and I see or hear something vaguely familiar. Oh, it's that sort of obnoxious young woman who was on TV all the time. Ah, she was me. I was she. I was her. I, some, some of them I could lip sync. I remember them so vividly. Other TV shows, I swear I have no recollection. Was I in Birmingham? Was I not wearing a kilt? I don't have a clue. Anyway, I had really nice hair. Didn't really appreciate it then. It was shiny and black. Number four, we had our first social distanced visit with friends. I have to say, it was like getting a shot of vitamin B12. It gave me energy. It gave me hope. We were all wearing masks. I think I think I wore gloves. I know I had my gloves. I'm not sure if I wore them all the time. I almost hugged our friends and luckily they wouldn't have hugged me back. So we protected ourselves, but it just felt great. I need more of it, but you know, a little will last me. And number five, decency. It's the minimum we should expect from one another. Just be decent. Acknowledge when you've made a mistake acknowledge that other people have different points of view with courtesy. What does it take? What does it take? All the belittling and the sniping and carrying automatic weapons to a rally to show how strong you are. That's not strength. That's not decent. I'm really, really, I just want someone to be polite. Someone I mean, not someone, I want everyone to just realize it's not just about you. It's about all of us. We're a community. That's what good manners are about, guys. That's why I care about etiquette. Not because I want people to use um, the right fork, although, you know, in my case I do, but because it helps us all get along with one another. Kumbaya. Okay. Coming up, Actress, writer, activist, podcaster, comedian, superwoman, June Diane Raphael. Don't go away. June Diane Raphael, you have made a lot of us feel like underachievers. And I don't want you to apologize, but... You have a full-time job acting in a full-time series, Mm -hmm. uh, Grace and Frankie. Mm -hmm. You have a podcast, at least. You've written a book called Represent about urging women to run for office. Mm -hmm. You have children. Mm -hmm. You have another podcast with your husband. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm leaving things out. Well, and you're uh, the an engineer. main thing is I've also co-founded w- the space we're in right. right now called the Jane Club. Not that that's the main thing. They're they're all of equal import. I think that they're all, um, I would put them all on the same plane. Well, maybe I put my children first. But yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of different things. And I believe in the Renaissance spirit of not you know, being told you have to stay in your lane and and just following what's interesting and the things that you're curious about. Well, I guess once upon a time, if you were on a TV show, that was your life. Mm -hmm. You had four cameras, you had to, it was a Mm full-time job. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't be on a second show. Right. And you couldn't, you know, if you had a drinking problem, that took up a lot of time. I mean, there wasn't a lot 
that you could do besides, yeah. and, and you know get divorced a few times that sure. takes time but really this is a new I guess even the gig economy even if you're a celebrity you can be part of the gig economy yeah I mean I will say I'm I'm yes I'm on a tv show I don't work every day I am on a tv show that stars Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin and and Martin Sheen and Sam Waterston and I play a character that yes is in it but I I'm very fortunate, especially after having small children, to have found a um, a job and a project where I don't work every day on that TV show. So um, there are other jobs, I'm sure, for the next TV series I do where I will be working every day. Um, that just hasn't been the case here, and I'm really grateful for that because it's allowed me to spend some of these really critical years with small children with them uh, which I've really enjoyed and pursue other things that I really care about also you know I mean we're going to get to one of my one of my important things but I don't do any of this on my own so even the Jane Club we have an incredible team I am not full-time here there are women who are putting their blood sweat and tears into this our CEO Zoe Regan and our COO Dory Howard who are really living in in the muck and the details in a way that I am not so um, I'm incredibly proud of my work here but it's not all me by any means what I want to say about it having just gone on a brief tour is yep. that unlike other women co-working spaces this doesn't feel like it's a branded um, ideology mm -hmm. it feels like you can just come in do what you have to do leave your children in the beautiful play mm -hmm. area and not worry about your kids while you're working. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's really why I started it. I had had my second child, and Trump was elected weeks after. And I was heading back to work and really struggling with that feeling of I'm either apologizing for having small children when I'm at this paid job, or when I'm with my children, I am hiding my professional work. And I, it, that, that experience, that transition hit me like a ton of bricks. And I felt really frustrated by the conversations and the panels and the discussions around how to balance these things. And I felt like, wow, these are a lot of words and dialogue. There's actually very little infrastructure to support these ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, of course there isn't because it hasn't been built with mothers and caretakers in mind. The, the workforce, the professional workforce, paid labor has not been built for, um, for women, mothers, caretakers. And so that was really what this space has been inspired by. The idea that women can come here they can, and men can bring their children here. Um, we really honor the work of parenting um, and honor the job of, and labor of parenting. Mm -hmm. And so we have some women here who don't get paid outside the home. And um, we support them being here, taking a break from their children, getting educated in, in whatever classes and offerings we have that day, doing some self-care so that they can head back to their kids better. Right. Um, and then, of course, we have many women and some men who come here and bring their children and drop them off and come upstairs where we are to work, to connect. Um, but a lot of what we talk about at the Jane Club is it, so many so many of our Janes come for the child care and then end up, end up staying for the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that feeling of being together, which turns out is really special. <laughs> it, it really is that's right. So instead of taking your kids to daycare and then driving on to mm -hmm. another place, mm -hmm. this is a place of mom care, mm -hmm. parent care, and daycare. That's that's exactly right. And we have some women, you know, we have classes, we, we call our child care um, floor the nest. So we have, we take care of children from three months on. And for so many of our Janes, it's that critical transition, that one that I talked about that inspired all of this, which is the return. Yes. Um, which can be uh, honestly quite devastating and traumatizing for so many women. And um, that step back in to a workforce that has that doesn't have nearly enough support for them. And 
I had become sort of obsessed with like, oh my God, but I, but I've spent my twenties and most of my thirties working to get to a point in my career where I feel like finally all these seeds I've been planting are starting to grow. And now I'm going to take a step back or two or three or two or three. Right. And that feels crazy. And I know that that um so many women are faced with that and so many women are are penalized because of it and there are real financial consequences that mothers see in the workforce i'm sure that a lot of people listening have been told things like uh what we're told mike bloomberg may have said Mm to to um an employee when told that she was pregnant kill it I once was up for a job when a man asked me, how many kids do you have? I said, two. He said, so you're not going to have a third. I said, well, I've been thinking wow. about it. He said, no, you're not. You know, and wow. that kind of thing. And and I work in a creative field, too, where mm-hmm. you would think it would be very better. better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and not. It, it's and, not. of course, men see the the opposite happen, where they start having families and there's tons of research that supports this and and employers assume that they're going to work harder right that they're actually going to be more invested in their professional careers where we we assume and there's bias that women will do less um that they will be less invested and, and so, suddenly and become real. disorganized yeah noodle heads right exactly even if they were totally together before their maternity right. leave yeah Okay, I, I'm not sure that I'm saying this right. My my children, who I refer to as my science experiments, will be rolling their eyes when they hear this. But I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to look at you. <laughs> when did you become woke? Oh God, I don't. You know, honestly, that was hilarious. I don't know that I am. I I really struggle with that term because I think okay, full honest answer. The, the problem I have with that idea is um, is because I feel like it implies that the work is done. I uh, feel like it implies that there's... Fully baked. Yeah, fully. that I'm now on the other side of my understanding of how my identity, my race, um, my gender identity, what what unearned privileges I have, how that impacts those around me. I don't feel like I'm on the, I think that work is going to continue the rest of my life. And I don't subscribe to the idea that it's happened. Is it happening? Am I on my journey? Yes, I am. Did Trump's election definitely accelerate it? Absolutely. Um, But I don't feel like I am anywhere near the other side of of that. Um, And... You know, it, it's an education and the work takes work. And so I, I think sometimes people use it because they want to feel like I did it. Gotcha. Because it's deeply uncomfortable to think about. It's deeply uncomfortable, I think, um, as a white person to think about my race. You know, I think white, most white people are, are not, we've never had to think about it. And so we don't. We've never had to talk about it. And so we don't. And, um, so to talk about it, to think about it, to read about it, to address it is, is new. And I certainly don't think it's something that's already happened for me. You know, I, I grew up in New York City, and I, where I still live, and I thought the whole, as everybody else did, that Hillary Clinton was going to be our president. Mm-hmm. And um, we even had a party that night to watch the returns. As my friend slithered out, crying and disgusted, I said, I'm sorry, this is the worst party I've ever given, and it's not my fault. Yeah. But I do think that I realized something that I had pretended maybe not to know, yeah. which is that there is misogyny everywhere. Yeah. And I said to, I have two daughters, and I said, I don't think they like us. I don't mm-hmm. I don't feel anything has changed. I feel like watching the debates, watching how the mm-hmm. press treats the two women who are still in the race for president, mm-hmm. that people may 
support them or praise them or or uh, be in awe of how they take on men, mm -hmm. but then say they're unelectable. Yep. I hear you, sister. <laughs> it's very upsetting. I mean, I totally agree. I have, you know, I'm in a lot of different progressive and activist circles and communities. And, you know, I find it really disturbing that it's, it's very hard for people to say, and a lot of women to say, like, I, and I will say it, I want a woman to be elected. I want to vote for a woman. And I radically love and support women. And I think that that, because we are products of a culture that tells us the exact opposite, and we are inundated with misogynistic images from the time we're born, you know, that there's a lot of, um, of work we have to do to get there. There's a lot we've internalized. I think I have more sympathy, but it, it does enrage me too. It's like electability is the most ridiculous topic. Like they're elect, I mean, who would have thought Trump was electable first yeah, of all? So like yeah. that just completely, you know, um, destroys that argument. But it's also, it's also, to me, it says a lot about, um, it just says a lot about us. Like it, they're electable if we say they're electable and if we elect them, period, well, full stop. Right. It's like yeah. the TV business. So yeah. and so every character has to be likable. Yes. Well, sometimes flawed, first of all, people are flawed. And secondly, yeah. their flaws are what make them interesting. Yes. And fun and mm -hmm. funny and, and probably fun to act. Yeah. I mean, I do think that I'm, I'm, really proud to support Elizabeth Warren. I want her to be president. I think she would be an incredible president. Um, and I really want to vote for a woman. And I, I say that without any apology or disclaimer. Right. Um, I don't think it needs one. <laughs> and I, uh, I do think you're right that it is, it's really shocking and upsetting. And I think sometimes we forget about it because we have to, because we have to survive. And we have to raise children. And, you know, um, it's hard to look at. So, which brings us perfectly to your book, Represent, which uh, I, I've heard you talk about it on other shows, and I've read it. And what you've done is almost make it impossible to not see yourself in a race of any size. But tell the story of the of how you decided you were going to do this yeah I mean it's you were at that party but I was on an airplane and I was really I was devastated by Hillary's lost I was devastated and I felt humiliated and embarrassed I felt so I feel I still feel so embarrassed I feel embarrassed too yeah it's a terrible feeling I feel embarrassed to be a woman I feel embarrassed that this happened um and but that feeling turned to anger very quickly, and I really was wrestling with uh, a, a big, you know, kind of life crisis of what am I doing with my life, and how am I staring into the eyes of my baby at that point? It was mm. a month old, and what will he be left with, and um, what's the best use of my time and talent, truly? And I considered running for office and letting go of everything else I'd been working on and just doing that. And I realized I did some, started doing some research and realized, wow, this process and civic engagement in general is really not that accessible. We, a lot of schools don't teach civics anymore. That's a big problem. Yes. And I, and I think intentionally so. Mm. I think the Obfuscate I, yes, the road absolutely. to office. Absolutely. Right. Um, and I became sort of obsessed with how mysterious it was for most people and how it seemed like this special club or, or you sort of had to be anointed mm -hmm. or, or you had to know the right people or you had to have a ton of money and you had to be white and you had to be college educated and you had to be a lawyer and you had to be all these things and and have a red suit and have a red suit and all the stuff and have the hair um and I, yeah i just sort of out of genuine rage uh became obsessed with creating a guideline and a map so that i could consider it 
and so that I had a process to go through. What I appreciate is how micro you get. Yeah. Because let's say you pick up the book and you're feeling all those things. You're feeling shut out of the process. Mm -hmm. But you can actually read a chapter about getting a good bra that fits mm -hmm. you so that you look good. Or what to do if you um, were fired from a job and you're humiliated and you think mm -hmm. that's going to stand in your way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are totally. things that are both big. How am I going to raise $5 million? Mm -hmm. How am I going to get on the radar? And also things that are very little. What am yes. I going to do with my kids when I want to go door to door? Yes. And and that those little things for many women are the big things too. Yes. And so I think the book starts with the premise of, of really honoring and acknowledging, as does the Jane Club, the fullness of women's lives, right? The the caretaking labor we do for small children, uh, even aside from like the physical caretaking, then there's the mental load that often we carry. And yes. then there's taking care of older parents. That work is usually, women are usually doing that work. That's right. Um, even with their in-laws, they're doing that work. So so then what's left for us? Um, and, and we're also, bringing our incomes into our home. So we're, we're working outside of the home as well. So for a lot of women, it really is in the details because we hit a point where so much um, of our day and our time is carrying these loads that we cannot consider the possibility. And the book really honors that, acknowledges that, and, and suggests that there are ways to still consider this. And of course, as, as you say in the book, there are hundreds of thousands of places a woman could run. Yes. She doesn't have to start with the Congress or Senate mm -hmm. or governor. She can, she can be a school board person. Mm -hmm. She can be a, um, an ombudsman, mm -hmm. comptroller. Yes, there are over 500,000 offices to right. run for. And I think right. sometimes the, the news cycle and the, you know, what we read and talk about over the water cooler is so focused on, on the federal level of our government right. that we don't fully understand that tons of decisions are being made at the state level. I mean, Republicans actually do understand this. They I will do say that. understand they've that. They've been understanding it and they've gotten a lot done that way. But, you know, there are major decisions happening at the local level and the state level that... Um, women are underrepresented up and down the ballot. Right. So it's not just underrepresentation on the federal level. We are underrepresented everywhere. And so those those offices, I think, women should consider. I mean, I've been really involved in the L.A. City Council race because of just how powerful our city council is in L.A. and how I really believe that we have an opportunity in L.A. to be an, on an international level a model city for combating climate change, for dealing with our, our homelessness issue and the crisis, truly, that we could model what the rest of the country does and the world. These are, you know, if you live in a city like that, city council has- Giant budget. Giant power. Giant influence. Absolutely. Yes. It's four million people. Yes. Yeah, so, that's um, not nothing. No, it's not nothing at all. So I, I really would encourage women to think about all of those offices and how- their passion and their expertise and, and their experience could be applied to solving problems that they see around them. I want to ask you advice. I see pictures of Ivanka Trump online. Yeah. And I become unaccountably enraged. <laughs> <laughs> I can't look at her. Worse is when she speaks in that breathy voice yeah. that I'm sure she paid a lot of money to learn. Yeah. What can I do to get through a day? I don't mind it when I see her with Jared because I feel Jared is her little water boy. Yeah. But pictures of her. Did you see her in front of the Taj Mahal? I today? did. I, oh, today? It, no, or I yesterday. didn't. And apparently she blurred the Taj Mahal so that she was the... Yeah. The, I become enraged. Yeah, I get it. I, I get it. I mean, listen, I don't listen to Donald Trump. I, right. I have I not... My eyeballs have not put 
themselves on his body and face and voice since 2016. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now I've heard him like through an airport and, but I can't turn it on and face it. Cause honestly it's very triggering for me. And I'm like, he's bringing up way too much. And I am so enraged and so horrified that I can't, I can't do it. I just can't do it. I do think Ivanka is, I mean, she's such a fascinating like foot soldier for the patriarchy. Yeah. She really is. It's like in her moderating influence, which is nothing. Of course. But it's also, you know, I think that of course, I mean, I wrote a whole book about encouraging women to run for office. Except for her. So (laughs) this is what I'll say about it. I do think women... Look, we're not a monolith. There are women who have governed terribly. There have been terrible women candidates. Just because you are a woman running for office, by no means does that suggest you will legislate and govern for women and children. Just doesn't mean that. Right. However, research does show that most women are running for office because they see a problem and they want to fix it. Research does suggest that most women are running for office and govern in a more moderate way and bring more money back to their districts and govern on behalf of women and children. So I do think, though, like some, sometimes I got to come back to like, what would it be to have Donald Trump as your father? Like, what has she learned about herself? Um, in, in my best days, <laughs> <laughs> in my most generous moments, you know, I, I encourage myself to focus on on him and not her. Well, I I am. Um spent some time with them I'm sorry. when he mm-hmm, when he opened his country house mar-a-lago as a hotel mm-hmm. in 1996 or 97 and there's one particularly enraging photograph of her sort of inclined on his lap and his yeah. she's wearing a butterfly camisole he had just told me how hot she was she was about 13 and his hand oh is God. right on her um, ribs, but maybe just where you wouldn't want your dad's. I mean, oh, he wasn't God. copying yeah. the field, but it was close. Yeah, so she was raised by a mentally ill and delusional guy. Correct, and what has she learned about herself? And, you know, I mean, that's sort of like, in, in, uh, that's my highest self coming in and uh, offering that. That's very woke. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? Okay, <laughs> I great. Think. I don't know. Um, I feel very angry but I also feel like one of his manias is that he is refined mm. it kills him that he's considered kind of crude and rude even though he plays up on it plays it up really? now. that's interesting well when I interviewed him he was all about wanting to get into the right clubs in Palm Beach I see okay which did not take him as a member and the way he's sort of grooming her to be his heir, a parent. Yeah, yeah. And that's heir, not heir. <laughs> Cheap joke. Yeah. Um, but, but the idea of a dynasty mm-hmm. is st- so does not take into account what is really happening in this mm-hmm. country. Yeah. And that's an, a, another new thought. You know, yeah, we've, I mean, had we've had dynasties. We've had dynasties before, yeah. yeah. I mean, we currently do have dynasties in the Senate, too. I mean, right. that is... You know, uh, and I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I hope we survive this. I, 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 I so waver. I've never had an experience quite like this where I'm like, I feel very hopeful sometimes. And I feel Jane Fonda said this, that this is the patriarchy, a white supremacist patriarchy sort of dying. And this is its last breath and it's at its most dangerous right because it's fighting it's the beast that's fighting at the end knowing it's going down so willing to take every last shot because it's aware that it's on its way out so I do feel hopeful I mean when I look at the millennial vote when I look at the youth vote I'm like I do feel hopeful and then I waver Mm. and then I waver and I feel terrible and yeah. uh, well working yeah. with jane yes. must be uh, uplifting in its i mean it and lily and sam waterston and martin sheen and everybody but particularly i used to work with jane on the radio and you just felt good yeah. seeing her because she's 
brilliant. Mm -hmm. She's lived through a lot. That's true, yep. And she has a totally, you know, uh, realistic s sense of herself, her destiny, mm -hmm. and what she can do best. And she, her fire drill Fridays, I know mm -hmm. you've done them. Mm -hmm. How big a group does she assemble these days? Oh, hundreds. I mean, the, the, I, we just went to the one in LA, the first one in California, because it's, it's, she's brought them here. Although any, you know, here's the thing, anyone can start a fire drill Friday in their community. You just text 877-877-JANE and you can find an entire toolkit and, and help for starting these, you know, f real fire drills and uh, I'll, sort of, if you want to sound the alarm in your own community about the effects of climate change and and fight for climate justice it's an incredible way to do it but jane has really started something that's unbelievable and she she also credits greta and mm -hmm. the the youth climate activists um and listening to them and following their lead um i have been so i can't, honestly i can't believe it i can't believe i get to have her as a mentor and a co-star and um, someone who's modeling what it means to age mm -hmm. and what it means to spend your privilege and to not hoard it, but to continually over and over spend it. It's remarkable. I'm, I don't know. I feel so unbelievably blessed. I get that. Uh, now, let's just talk for a sec about comedy, because when we talk about politics, I'm hearing myself cry in the background of this yeah. conversation uh, and groaning and thinking it's all terrible. And I, I, I'm with you. I feel some days I feel like, oh, I see a, a clearing mm -hmm. in the future. And then I think, eh, who am I kidding? Yeah. But is it hard to be funny for you in, and your troop of funny and silly people or or do you find I mean, it's well it's probably more necessary yeah it is necessary and I do think that the only anecdote to any of this is activism and is engagement and that hopeless feeling when I'm in community I mean we're in a community space right now at the Jane Club I have several different activist communities that I work with um I find so much joy in being together and it's really so healing and fun um I love comedy I just love it so much it, and it's so life-affirming to me and joy is so necessary through the darkest of times and I mean listen I come back to this a lot but let's put the climate aside for one second because that is truly like a different beast but you know I am hopeful about a lot of things I really am and I do feel like most people are where we are despite all the problems and they're real I think we're living better lives. I mean, I think of people in cave times, you know, scrounging around for their food and this and that. And I'm like, okay, less people live in poverty. I, I just, I have to believe that um, we will continue to, um, as a human race, continue to lift each other up. Now, the climate and the planet are very concerning and that, that I actually don't know about. But I, I, I have no, I definitely don't feel, well, maybe I do a little bit, actually. Maybe I do have a harder time doing comedy. I don't know. I, I think I need it more. And yet there are things definitely where I'm like, oh, that's not as funny anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Oopsie. And, but then other things are super funny. So, yeah, we're, we're in the midst of another cultural, you know, uh, excavation, yeah. revolution, whatever you want to call it, the Me Too movement, which I think, again, people are like, oh, it happened. I'm like, oh, I think it's just begun, folks. Oh, it's just <laughs> like, begun. I think we this just is, got started. This is Weinstein day one. Day one. We have a lot to see. I'll yeah, absolutely. I just want to say I've had two back surgeries. I didn't need a walker. Come on, Harvey. That yeah, was. I mean, <laughs> really? I know. What? But uh, again, I was always so fascinated by how he lured his victims in and even listening to the recording of him 
with that woman in the hotel mm. room, so much of it was making himself a victim, was was preying on what is often so wonderful about women, their empathy. Their empathy. Yes. He said to a woman after he'd been aggressive with her, you have to come with me because you're going to embarrass me in front of my yeah. friends. And it worked. Of course. Of I, course. Under- I understood that. I really did. I understood that idea of, oh, I, but I don't want to embarrass someone. Right. You know, right. I don't. I would never want anyone to feel that way. I wouldn't want to be responsible for that. I totally understood why he, I mean, it makes me so sad. It's like why, I mean, this is this is the worst analogy that I'm going to say, but I think a lot about why beagles are tested on in, in animal testing. It's because they're, they have a personality that is, is more, it's easier to test on them. Mm. And then, I don't know. I mean, again, that's a terrible analogy, but it just, it really made me angry and sad to sort of use what I think is one of the most wonderful qualities about women against them in in such a terrible way. Yes. And, and then once these women have been assaulted or raped or masturbated on, then humiliate them in court. And make Harvey the victim of these it's rapacious the of women who wanted jobs yeah. in Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, it's quite it's quite something. It is. It is. And I do think, you know, an interesting thing about the coverage of Harvey and, and some of the stories that came out. Um, and I read She Said, and I really mm-hmm. loved it. Mm-hmm. But e- even even the, some of the language they used to describe actresses, models, women who wanted to to get ahead in their careers in the entertainment industry, it struck me that (laughs) there was a narrative underneath all of that, which is like, oh, we all know women will do, actresses will do whatever they need to do. We all know that they're going to do anything to get the part. And it really made me so angry because I was very in tune with some of the language that was used to describe these women, because when I think of actresses, artists who want to do this art, art form and want to share something about themselves and want to share about their humanity, portray someone else's, um, be vulnerable and open on a set so mm-hmm. that they can say something and share something that is beautiful work. And I found time and again that the way we talk about actresses is like, well, we all know they're basically prostitutes, right? Like we're going to start at that premise. And I really take issue with that. Um, and I, I, I really encourage people when they're talking about this trial in particular that has to do with the entertainment industry to be aware of how we're covering these stories and in particular how we are talking about actresses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As if no other woman in at no other time has ever had to face that horrible conflict. What do right. I do? Right. I'm vulnerable. I'm alone. This guy yeah. said his uh, his assistant said, "Oh, just run upstairs, have a meeting. He's mm-hmm. he's running late." Mm-hmm. I mean, who wouldn't do that? Of course, and right. also I think that what I question too is the assumption of, well, they all wanted to break into the industry to get famous and wear the clothes and wear the costumes and and there are there's such a dismissal in that language yes. of the work uh, that it actually takes and requires to be brave and be an actress right and there's i just think there's i really noticed it during the harvey coverage there's just a huge dismissal of that work um and i think it's not taken seriously yeah i think that's a good point i think of people who have to be if you're if you're on a team in at your accounting firm or at your consulting firm or at your law firm, you get credit with your team, but you also get privacy. Mm -hmm. And your personal identity is not up for criticism. Mm -hmm. And here you are, a woman actress or a woman writer, and people feel they can not only criticize you, but can judge you as, Mm -hmm. 
well, she's not enough. She doesn't spend enough time with her kid. Mm -hmm. Or why is she selling her family down the river in this autobiography? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's just, yeah. it just doesn't stop. That's true. It doesn't. And damn I, it. I know. And I think women are really targets for it. Um, and I don't know what it's like to be an accountant. Maybe it's just as hard. I, I, I don't think that it's necessarily better or worse. And I, and yes, I think that there are certain enormous privileges that come with it, like with the position I'm in with my career that I really, really appreciate. But you worked awfully hard to and get yes, here. And I absolutely worked hard to get here. And I also am acutely aware of I work mostly when I'm acting and with male crews and male technicians staring at me because um, that's their job. Mm -hmm. And it is still a very male dominated form. Mm -hmm. It just is behind the scenes, especially. And, um, you know, I, I really look up to actresses like Jane and like Lily who can come out and open themselves up, share something about themselves, their grief, their joy, their sexuality, all of it, because <laughs> it, the space is not set up to do that. Right. So, they are working even in the best of circumstances and we are in on our show we're in that circumstance and you it's have a female executive yes. producer and right but even so it's not no just simply just simply when you're looking at the numbers um and that's just the reality of the film industry and tv industry i have great admiration for actresses and what they do and i really think it's incredible and it, we should really think about the language that is used yes. to describe it. Um, I am personally curious about, and, and I admit to myself that I am curious about why shows like The Bachelor, which you sent up in Burning Love, mm -hmm. which I loved, why now, with a sense of women having at least a little bit more agency than we ever did, Yeah why we are now so devoted to these idiotic shows in which women do what any of us who have children have said to our kids you will not compete for a guy <laughs> don't do that you you know no guy's worth it yeah and then we find ourselves watching these competitions <laughs> that are what are they? Are they 1950s know. come to life? Yeah. Are they hypocrisy come to life? And I, then we I, I cheer. I really don't know. We cheer when women are bad to one another, like these Real Housewives shows. Yeah, I mean, well, I do love the Real Housewives. But I have, I sort of fall on the, like, Roxanne Gay end of her Real Housewives reading, which is, first of all, the Real Housewives are, are usually in their 40s and 50s. Right. Mostly 50s, sometimes 60s. So I really actually appreciate the portrayal of older women on TV that people are obsessed with. Um, and yes, and I also appreciate that they're behaving badly. You know, for me as an actor, there are times where I watch The Real Housewives and I cannot believe I get to see it, that I get this insight into the rage and the insecurity and the just insanity of these women. I find it really interesting to watch. The Bachelor stuff does not, they're so young that it's not interesting to me. I'm just much more curious about The Real Housewives women because I find them to be much richer and have much more experience behind them. But I I will say, I think there's another reading of the housewives that is a, a sort of a feminist reading, which is they are, and there's absolutely tons of anti-feminist stuff on the show too. But I, I believe it's a little more complex because there are very real friendships on those shows. There's real insanity. There's women doing things wrong and failing and failing and failing. There's women trying things and failing. And there's women in their full sexuality in their mid-50s. Full, you know. And I, I enjoy watching it. So this is June Diane Raphael's five things that make her life better. Number one. My nanny, Juliana. 
Do you want some information about that or yeah, you just get it? Course. Yeah, no, I, I well, get it. you know, we talked How a little you... bit about the, the fullness of women's lives and the caretaking that we do both with elderly parents and small children and Sometimes I get asked, well, you even said it. How are you doing all these things? Right. And, well, I'm not doing it alone. And one of the ways in which I'm able to do it is because I have an amazing domestic worker in my life and one who I really value. And she is just a huge part of my village. And I'm also a big supporter of the Domestic Workers Alliance and making sure more women understand how to employ domestic workers and how to treat the domestic workers in your life with with um, respect and dignity and making sure you're honoring their rights. A lot of people, there's just a lot of mystery around the mm-hmm. employment of domestic workers. So she has changed my life for the better and I, I couldn't live without her. Right. Number two, shared photo streams on iPhones. Uh huh. So um, my sister doesn't live here. She lives in New York. And I love getting photos every day of her kids and feeling like it's really collapsing distance for me. Yes. Yes. So I, I appreciate That's that technology. That's good. And you, can, you, can, you know things about people that you might not have known. Yes. What is that bruise on Todd's exactly. knee? Exactly. Yes. 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 Um, number three. Number three. We just touched on it, but bravo. I do enjoy the housewives. I do enjoy it's for me and my girlfriends. It's a really fun way in to it's both about the housewives and it's about something for us to talk about. And it's about using the housewives as both a mirror at points and a window into other um, experiences. And I, it's also just pure escapism. And in these times, yes, I like it. We need that. Yes. Um, The other thing that I love is money. Huh. (laughs) (laughs) You like money. I love money. And um, I appreciate being at a point in my life, I'm very aware of it, that for so long I just was so concerned. And it is really nice to feel like I have a, a... I can take a job without feeling like it's just paying for my health insurance. And that's a distinction I'm really making and I'm I'm really loving. Great list. Yeah. So and the last one is my assistant Anna, who I've I just brought her into my life a, a few months ago and wow, I don't know what I was doing without her. And she's really uh amazing and I'm not as organized. Organization has never been my, it's just not my ministry. (laughs) So, um, wow, it's amazing to have someone support you who has that skill set. Fantastic. That's a great list. And it's great talking to you and meeting you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Having you. Right, of course. (laughs) And thank you for coming on to my podcast equipment. Yes. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.